everyone. Um, if you're anything like me, I suspect some of you are, then you lose things from time to time. It seems that perhaps collectively we've lost something as well at Ormskirk, but uh, there we go. Um, and when you lose something, you then waste time in looking for things, don't you? When we lose things, sometimes it matters more um, on some occasions than others. Some things that we lose can easily be replaced, um, and it's only a temporary inconvenience until such time that we find a replacement. But other things are much more serious, either because it's something that's very valuable that's gone missing, or because it's something which is virtually irreplaceable because it's only one of a kind and you simply can't obtain another one of them. And then there are things which they might be worth, in actual fact, very little, but they have a value because they have a sentimental value and they're of great value to the person that owns them. So what we draw from that is that what we start to appreciate is that when something is lost, it matters more if the item that has been lost has a value to the person who lost it. And immediately that brings us to that chapter in Luke chapter 15, which we shared together by way of our reading through Chris this afternoon, where we read of three things which were lost by three different people, all of which were then found. But each of those things had a value. It had a value for the, for the person who'd lost them. And we also noticed that on each occasion there was joy and happiness when the item, or in one case the person, was found. So our thoughts today are going to centre on that chapter in Luke chapter 15 and the parables which we've read where Jesus spoke about the lost sheep, the lost coin and the lost son. And already we're behind on this. So there we go. So those three parables. And we're going to ask the questions, well, what do they teach us and what can we learn from them? And perhaps how can we apply that in our lives? Well, it was the, the murmurings of the scribes and the Pharisees which led Jesus to speak these parables. The Pharisees were a group of Jewish religious leaders, a, a priestly class, who were scrupulously exact in their interpretation and observance of the Jewish law. They were a group of men who were very legalistic in their approach. Everything had to be very exact and nothing was left to chance. But during his ministry, Jesus had criticised them for this approach, reasoning that this wasn't the type of service that God was, was really looking for. The scribes, well, they were a non-priestly group of men, but they were also very focused on, on following and interpreting the Old Testament law. And, and many of the people looked to the scribes for, for guidance in how to follow the law and how to live their, their own lives. But Jesus had criticised both groups of men. He'd actually referred to them on one occasion as being whited sepulchres, meaning that they were men who were more interested in how they presented outwardly to, to the people about them, um, rather than being concerned about the thoughts and the motivations of their hearts. And, and Jesus used that analogy of a whited sepulchre because sepulchres in the time of, of Jesus, they were painted white on the outside, so they looked clean and tidy. But of course, inside a sepulchre, there's nothing but um, rotten corruption. And both the scribes and the Pharisees, as we've read in this chapter, thought that it was completely inappropriate for Jesus to spend time with people who they regarded as being sinners. Men and women who didn't live up to the scriptural ideal, ideals that the scribes and Pharisees uh, lived in their lives. People who, for one reason or another, didn't follow the religious ceremonies of the temple. Those who failed in their observance of the countless rules and regulations of religious life. Many of which, of course, were actually written by the religious authorities themselves, rather than rules and regulations and commands which were found in the Old Testament scriptures. And it was those people who the scribes and the Pharisees chose to disassociate themselves from. They wanted to have nothing to do with them. They thought that they were unclean and, and, and they referred to them as, as sinners. But Jesus, well, he was happy to spend time with those people and to talk to them because he wanted to share with them the hope of the gospel message, the good news that he was teaching to the people. 
And so that was the context in which Jesus now chose to spoke to, to speak these parables. That's what we're told in, in the first two verses. And as we think about his words, we'll start to understand the lessons that he was teaching and the message specifically that he was trying to get across to the people who he was talking to, which was the scribes and the Pharisees. Did you notice, though, that in verse 3 of that chapter, we're told that Jesus spoke this parable unto them parable in the singular so could it be that in fact we to think of these three par what we normally think of as three parables are in fact one long parable with a central message but perhaps with different angles certainly as we've read those parables do have a common theme so we come firstly then to the lost sheep and jesus uses the example of the shepherd who, finding that one of his sheep is missing, leaves the 99 in the safety of their fold, and he sets out to, to find the sheep that is lost. And he searches until he finds it. Such is the importance of him, to him of the sheep that has got lost. And having found the sheep, he then brings it home safely to, to the fold, and he then celebrates with his friends over the fact that the sheep has been found. So what does it mean? What was Jesus teaching? Well, it was a well-accepted analogy and something which would be understood by the scribes and the Pharisees to who Jesus was talking, that the Jewish religious leaders, they themselves, the scribes and the Pharisees, were the appointed shepherds of God's people Israel. And we read these words back in the Old Testament as spoken by the prophet Ezekiel. They're God's words. And this is about the shepherds who weren't doing a good, their, their, their job properly. We read, Son of man... Prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. And they were scattered, because there is no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. And the chapter then continues with further condemnation of the shepherds of Israel. And God says that as a result of their poor shepherding, he would become Israel's shepherd, and that he would seek out his sheep who were lost and cause them to lie down safely. And it was the Lord Jesus who was now fulfilling that role on behalf of his heavenly father. And he described the people in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36 as sheep having no shepherd. And that was simply because the, the religious leaders had failed to do their job properly. And he declared to the people that um, he was the good shepherd who knows his sheep. That's what he said, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. So we see a contrast, don't we? A contrast on the one hand where there were the Jewish religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees to who these comments were directed, who were appointed, who were the appointed shepherds of Israel, but who were in fact failing to do their job properly and actually chose to disassociate themselves from those who really needed them. And then there was the Lord Jesus, who was the shepherd of God's appointing, made it his responsibility to search out the lost sheep of the house of Israel and call them to the promise of salvation and not only that but Jesus would go on later to lay down his life for the sheep giving his all in caring for his flock and the parable then finishes with these words in verse 7 we read I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over 99 just persons which need no repentance and so we now see another contrast don't we a contrast between what were the murmurings of the scribes and the pharisees 
when they saw Jesus talking to those who they, who they referred to as sinners. And now the joy of the angels in heaven. The scribes and Pharisees were murmuring about how Jesus was teaching those who they regarded as being outcasts. How much better it would have been if their focus had have been on helping those that had a genuine need and helping them and guiding them in serving the Lord. Well, the ministry of the Lord Jesus was all about bringing hope and encouragement to the people he taught. And the parable of the lost sheep demonstrated very clearly that the Jewish religious leaders were, were not doing their job properly. And rather than murmuring about the ministry of the Lord Jesus, they needed to be fulfilling their role in caring for those who were the lost sheep of the house of Israel and bringing them back to the fold. But we can also apply this to ourselves because if we profess to be the disciples of the Lord Jesus, then surely it follows that in trying to reflect a little of the character of the Lord Jesus in our lives, then each of us has a responsibility to search out those who are lost. We have a responsibility, don't we, to preach the word and to bring more lost sheep into the safety of the ecclesial fold. Well, let's move on now to the parable of the lost coin. And in many ways, both parables tell the same story. Something which was lost is found, and there is joy because of the recovery of that lost item. Both parables were drawn from everyday incidents. Just as there were sheep and shepherds everywhere in the country, so there were families making a simple living off the land. And in the parable of the lost coin, we're not told about the value of the coin, but we are told that it was one of ten coins, possibly forming part of a bridal ornament for, for either a, a woman's head or for, for her neck. But whether it was worth a great deal or whether it was worth very little, it would probably have, have had great sentimental value and something which the woman would hold as being very special to her. But one thing that is significant is that as an inanimate object, the coin itself could have nothing to do with the fact that it had become lost. Whereas in the previous parable, the sheep may have chosen to wander away from the safety of the fold or the safety of the guidance of the shepherd um, and have become lost as a result. Well, that certainly couldn't happen in the case of the coin. The coin had been lost by its owner and it was the owner who then searched for it. So perhaps we can imagine the scene. The woman discovers that she's lost one of her ten coins and immediately she makes efforts to find it. And that wouldn't be an easy task, would it? Because the houses in those days were often very dark and um, that was in an attempt to keep out the heat. And the easiest way to find a tiny coin would have been to sweep together the dust of the trodden earth floor and then examine the pile of sweepings to see if the coin was present amongst that pile of dust perhaps with the help of a lighted candle. Well, the woman found the coin, and when it was found, she then called her friends, and there was rejoicing in the house. Now, in looking for a difference in how we can interpret the meaning of those two parables, we notice that in the parable of the lost sheep, it's the shepherd who does the searching. And being a shepherd was the role of a man, in fact, the shepherd in verse 4 is referred to as being a man. When looking for the coin, it's a woman who does the searching. And in the New Testament scriptures, the, the church or the ecclesia of believers is often described as being the bride of Christ. In other words, as, as a woman. Well, we haven't time to establish that in detail, but assuming that that is the case and that the woman in the parable does in some way represent the church or the ecclesia then it helps us to understand why Jesus spoke seemingly two seemingly very similar parables but there was a slightly different emphasis between them we've seen in the parable of the lot that the lost sheep was about the role of Jesus in looking for the lost sheep of the house of Israel and ourselves as individuals seeking out the well-being of those who need the hope of the gospel but if the woman in the parable was the church or the ecclesia, then what we learn from this is we see the, the ecclesia's responsibility, the church's responsibility in caring for its members, 
and searching for those who've gone astray, something which is done collectively or perhaps in an organised way. So it's the responsibility of the ecclesia or the church as a whole. Now that interpretation may perhaps not have been as apparent to the scribes and the Pharisees who Jesus was talking to. But in many ways that doesn't matter, does it? The more basic principle of the importance of looking for those who are lost in terms of their faith and their belief, it still stands, doesn't it? The scribes and the Pharisees, whether individually or collectively, they, they were failing in their duty of looking after the religious needs of the nation. And this second reminder, as spoken by Jesus, wouldn't go amiss. Well, we come now to the third and the longest parable in the chapter, what we often call the parable of the, the prodigal son. Prodigal meaning wasteful. But it could equally be called the parable of the lost son, or perhaps the parable of the forgiving father, or the parable of the misguided elder brother, as we shall see. It's a parable which perhaps more than any other touches on our emotions, as we can in this particular parable appreciate the feelings of the father who'd lost his son. We can perhaps understand and relate to the frustration of the elder son at the welcome home that was given to his younger brother. And we see the initial foolishness of the lost son who then had the courage and the humility to return home and to ask forgiveness of his father. So the parable of the lost son, as we've read, it introduces lots of personal factors, which it wasn't possible to do in the previous parables. Because a sheep, well, it might realise it's lost, but it doesn't appreciate its foolishness in wandering away from the rest of the flock. And a coin certainly has no sense of loss in any way. But this parable, through the experiences of the lost son, helps us to understand our true position before God and the response which we each need to make. So let's look at the verses. We've read that a man had two sons and that the younger son asked for the portion of the family wealth that would be his. And we can assume that this was going to be a third of the estate, given that the elder son would have received a double portion. And having been given his inheritance, the son decides to leave the family home and he goes off and he enjoys himself. He lives for the here and now. He has a good time in what's described there in the chapter as, as riotous living um, until the time comes that his money actually runs out. And it's then that life becomes difficult. And we can imagine that his newfound friends, who were all around him when he got plenty of money, they decide to desert him. And the man is forced to take a very menial job, that of feeding the pigs. And that would be, have been a particularly degrading job for someone who was, who was a Jew, because pigs were understood to be unclean animals. But it was his change in situation which caused the man to see the error of his ways. He quickly realised the mistakes which he'd made in his life. He understood that the pleasures of this life don't actually last, that they don't provide any real hope. He realised that he'd been a lover of pleasure rather than a lover of the things which really matter in life. And it had got him nowhere and he'd nothing to look forward to. And so it was that that change of circumstances brought about a change of mind and attitude in this man's life. He realised that within his family setting there was safety and there was security and there was hope of good things to come. And so he made that decision to return to the family home and he made the honest or decided to make that very honest confession um, as we've read there in verse 18, that he had sinned against heaven. He realised that he'd lived in a way which wasn't in accordance with God's will and that he'd sinned against his father by not remaining loyal to him. And he considered that he was no longer worthy to be called his son, but would accept a position as a servant in his father's household. And to even think about saying that shows that the son's outlook on life had now completely changed. He acknowledged that he'd been unwise 
and self-indulgent and accepted that his behaviour had made him unworthy of being a son in his father's household. Here was a man who, by his experiences, had become truly repentant of his past life and the errors which he'd made. So enter now the forgiving father. A father who'd been looking for his son from the day that he left and a father who was ready to forgive. Before his son had even finished making his confession, his father had arranged for a robe to be given to him and a ring to be put on his hand and shoes on his feet and a great celebration was called for because the son who had been lost was now found. So the parable of the lost son very clearly depicts our own situation in life. God is the father of all creation. Each and every one of us is a member of the human race which God created and therefore God is our father of each and every one of us. But there was a family rift. Adam and Eve, way back in Genesis, chose to do what God as their father had asked them not to do. They went their own way, just like the man in the parable. And as a result, there was a division between the Lord God and his creation. And yet the God of heaven is a forgiving God. And for those who acknowledge and understand and appreciate their sinful position before him, then the Lord God will forgive and he'll welcome us back into his household. And he'll provide for us robes of righteousness and he'll give us the assurance of good things to look forward to in the coming kingdom. And just as there was joy in the household at the son's return, so it is that we're assured that there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repents and joy in the presence of the angels. So for each and every one of us, the parable of the lost son contains a real hope, doesn't it? It gives us the assurance that if we are truly repentant, and if we make the effort to live our lives as, as God wants us to, whatever's gone on before, if we turn to God and repent and accept the fact that our, our previous lives were wrong, then if we then choose to follow the Lord's command, which includes the command that we should be baptised, that's an important part of what we read, then we should be able to address then the Lord God as our Father once more and come into a much closer relationship with him just as the lost son returned home and was accepted again by, by his father. There's an important aspect of the parable which we haven't looked at as yet. And for the scribes and the Pharisees who Jesus was speaking to, it was the most important aspect of all. It was the elder brother. The son who had seemingly remained loyal to his father and remained on the family farm whilst his younger brother had gone off the rails. When the lost son returned, when the, the younger brother arrived back and his father arranged a celebration, the older son's reaction wasn't perhaps as we think it might have been, but it wasn't one of pleasure and delight in hearing that his younger brother had returned, but instead we're told that it was one of anger and annoyance. Luke chapter 15 and verse 29. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And in those verses there, in what he says to his father, he couldn't even bring himself to refer to the man as his brother. He refers to him instead as this thy son. Well, perhaps we're sympathetic to how the elder son felt. Perhaps on the surface it, it, it does seem unfair that having wasted a third of his father's wealth, there was a celebration to welcome him home even if the celebration was for his return rather than his achievements. But if we think about it more, what we start to see is what Jesus was driving at and the lesson that he was teaching. We're told that the elder son, 
had been serving his father all these years. He'd done what was expected of him, but what we're not told is what his motivation was. At the heart of the older brother's complaint that we've read about the celebration was that he'd never been given a kid of the goats that he might celebrate and have a good time with his friends. And it seems to me that by saying that, the older brother was revealing a desire and a sympathy towards his younger brother's sinfulness. Whilst he'd stayed at home and done what was expected of him, he was doing it somewhat grudgingly, and his real desire was to do as his brother had done and to enjoy himself with riotous living. And if we think about it like that, we see that he also was a lost son, but his true feelings hadn't really until now been made plain. So we see a contrast, don't we? A contrast between a son who did wrong, but came to recognise his sinfulness and came to repent, and a son who was outwardly doing what was right, but whose heart was wrong before his father, and perhaps he didn't even fully realise that himself. And if we understand the parable in that way, then we see that the elder son shows us what was wrong with the way in which the scribes and the Pharisees were serving God. Outwardly, they were doing everything correctly, the whited sepulchres idea. They were following the religious laws in every last detail, but in reality, their hearts weren't right before God because their motivation was wrong and they'd failed to recognise their sinfulness before God. They'd become self-righteous and although they claimed to be serving the Lord, they were in fact strangers before him. And that's why this parable was so relevant to the people that Jesus was talking to. It was relevant to the scribes and the Pharisees because in what he said, there was a very clear message to them, telling them that they were conducting themselves in what wasn't an acceptable way before God. And in fact, they were um, not worshipping God in the way that he wanted them to because they hadn't recognised their true position before the Lord. And finally, what I think comes through most strongly in this parable is the forgiving nature of the father. The father could so easily have cast off his younger son and have had nothing more to do with him. He could have refused to take him back into the family home. He could have rejected him once and for all. But the parable shows us the forgiving nature of the father in heaven of a father who was provided a way of salvation through the Lord Jesus for all those who recognise their position as sinners before him. A father who is willing to turn his back on all that has gone before for those who choose to serve him. And we read these words. Possibly. <laughs> In John's first epistle. Behold, what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And those words contain hope of a real promise, don't they? They tell us of a time when Jesus will have returned to the earth to set up God's kingdom. And when all those who have tried to serve God in their lives, having recognised their, their sinful position before him and having responded in the way that he commands of us, will truly be called the sons and daughters of God. Three parables then. Three parables about things which were lost and things which were found. Let us each pray that in our own lives we shall look for and find the things which really matter in life. And that if we're lost, we might be found. That there might be joy in heaven over another sinner who has repented.